Let's open our Bible to Philippians chapter 1 that Dominic just read so well for us. Philippians chapter 1. The title of this morning's sermon is To Die is Gain. And that, of course, comes from Philippians 1 and verse 21, where Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To die is gain. I think that intellectually, as the people of God, we can understand that statement. But I think sometimes we struggle with it, really, in our hearts. Can we really say in our hearts this morning that to die is, is gain? That it would be advantageous and profitable for us to die? I want to ask you this morning, how would you fill in the blank in your mind and in your heart when I say to die is fill in the blank? What would you say? Deep down in your heart, maybe no one else would know. What would you say? Would you say that maybe to die would be very inconvenient? That's one range of possibilities. Would you say that to die makes me apprehensive, honestly? Would you say that to die is depressing, or would you maybe even say that to die is terrifying? Paul, the apostle, he saw death as a definite gain. Can, can you look at your life on earth? And you know, we talked in class this morning about the many blessings that God approves of in this life that we can enjoy. And I think most of us would say we enjoy the things of this life. We enjoy our families. We enjoy celebrating those birthdays and those anniversaries. And we enjoy just all of the blessings of life that God has given. And yet, could you look at all of those things and say in your heart, I would gladly push all of that aside because to die is very much better. I think we struggle with that. I know that I do. And I'm preaching to myself this morning. I want you to know that as well. To die is gain. I want to help us to see this morning that we can see death as a blessing if we're in Christ Jesus. For those who are in Christ, one of the greatest blessings of the Christian life is that we don't have to be afraid of death anymore. The fear of death has enslaved mankind since the beginning. In fact, the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, Through death, Jesus rendered powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. Death and the fear of death, it enslaves people. But you know what we have in Christ Jesus. We don't have to fear death anymore. It doesn't have to enslave us anymore. And we can say with Paul, with confidence, to die is gain. And that's where I want us to get. And I, I want us to grow in this kind of thinking, both in my life and in your lives. And these promises... These, this statement, to die is gain, I want you to know it's only for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, before we get into this text, and before we start to ask the question, how can I, how can I begin to view death as gain in my, in my mind? Let's talk about some preliminary things that I think we need to address. I don't want anyone here to say or to feel in their heart, well, I'm pretty apprehensive about dying and so, therefore, I'm not a very good Christian. Therefore, I'm not a very faithful Christian. I don't want you to think that, because I think we can, we can look forward to death. We can look forward to what death ushers us into, and it'll usher us into the presence of God and of Jesus Christ. And yet, 
we can think in our hearts, I'm still a little bit nervous about that. I'm a little bit nervous about what it's going to feel like. I'm a little bit nervous about the pain and the suffering that sometimes comes with, with death. And I think it's like anything in life. You think about if you're married, that when you were about to get married, and you, you, I'm sure you thought to yourself, this is what I want. This is, this is what... I'm just so blessed to be a part of this upcoming marriage, but still there can be some apprehension, right? What if I say the wrong thing? What if the ceremony doesn't go well, et cetera, et cetera? Or maybe it's like having a child. Oh, I've never wanted anything so bad in my life than to have this child, and yet, um, if a first-time parent especially, I'm a little nervous about it. Because anything in our life that is unknown, that we haven't experienced before, it can bring with it some apprehension. So I don't want you leaving this morning thinking, well, I, I do have a little bit of nervousness about death, and so therefore I'm not a very good Christian. I don't think that's true. But I think this is something that we can grow in and start to see more deeply and more clearly that, yes, to die is gain. And sometimes we say in our, in our hearts, I do believe that to die is gain. I really do believe that. And yet, there are some things in this life that I still would like to take care of. You know, that's a biblical thought. That's a thought that Paul had. If you look at Philippians 1 with me, uh, look at verse 21. He says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. Paul was, was debating with himself. You can see it in this passage. I do want to go home and be with the Lord. That is gain. That is very much better. But he was thinking about his brethren. He was thinking about the work that he still had to accomplish here on this earth. And I think that we can do that too. And it's very good and very biblical and right. You might say, I have family members that I'm trying to reach for the Lord. And I just hope that the Lord gives me more time to do that. I have children that I want to raise. I want to, I want to lead them in the paths of the Lord, and I just hope that the Lord gives me enough time to do that. And this is all good and right. And yet we can have those feelings and those thoughts and still say to ourselves, but to die is very much better. And I still believe that. The third sort of preliminary thing this morning I want you to know that if you are grieving the loss of a loved one, whether recently or many years ago, it doesn't mean that you have a weak faith. It doesn't mean that you're less of a Christian. Even the strongest of Christians, they grieve when they lose a loved one. And it's good and it's right. In fact, again, you look at Paul's life. Flip over to chapter 2 of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, uh, look at verse 25. Paul was going to send his brother and fellow worker, Epaphroditus, to uh, be with the church there. And he says in verse 25, But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Epaphroditus was ill. And look at verse 27. For indeed he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but also on me. So that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Even Paul with all of his faith, with all of his strong commitment to the Lord, he said, I'm so thankful that the Lord didn't let Epaphroditus die because I would have had sorrow upon sorrow. And so it's not wrong to grieve and to be sad about the loss of a loved one. We can grieve and be sad and still realize and understand that if our loved one was in the Lord, they're in a much better place. And so, with those things said, I want to ask the question this morning. 
How can we come to see death as gain? Truly to see it that way in our hearts. Not just to say the words, not just to understand it intellectually, but to truly believe in our hearts, death is gain. And so we're going to look at this passage in Philippians 1. Uh, look, at, look at verse um, 22 with me again. Paul says, But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. We learn a lot from this little verse here about Paul's thinking and Paul's attitude that we can learn from this. Uh, Paul is hard-pressed. He, he, he has this desire to be with Christ, and yet he has the desire to help the church. He has this desire that would be great for him to go home and be with the Lord, and yet he knows it would be better if he stayed in this body on this earth to help the brethren. And so he's torn between these two. But I want you to notice what he says in verse 23. He says, I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, and that is very much better. And I want you to notice uh, up in verse 21 as well, as we go through this passage, what are the things in Paul's mind, in Paul's attitude, in Paul's heart that caused him to be able to say to die is gain? First of all, in verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We can come to see death as gain by living for Christ. And I... I submit to you that if we're not living a Christ-centered life, we won't see death as gain. And Paul had this attitude. You look at Paul's life. We covered this last week. He was fully committed and fully Christ-centered, and everything he did was about Christ. And it was because of that that he said, death is gain to me. It was because of his relationship with Christ that he said, death is gain to me. And I want us to, to think about that, that no, I may not be a preacher, I may not be a teacher, I may not be a missionary, but I'm a father, I'm a mother, I'm a son, I'm a daughter, I have a job, or I go to school, or whatever it is that I do in life, whatever it is that, that I go about my daily life, I want it to be all about Christ. I want it to be centered on Christ. I want a Christ-centered, Christ-focused life. If we have that attitude, we'll begin to see death as gain. But on the other hand, for those who have walked away from Christ, for those who have become lukewarm in their walk, for those who have gone back into the world, for those who are ignoring His Word, there will be nothing but fear surrounding death. There will be nothing but terrifying expectation of judgment surrounding death if we walk away from Christ. And I want you to know this morning that there may be some here, I don't know. It may be that only you know and only God knows that in my heart and in my mind I've walked away from Christ. I've stopped listening to His Word. I've stopped responding to Him. And you'll never see death as gain if we, if we live our lives that way. But if we would live a Christ-centered life, we could see death as advantage, as profit, as what's best for me. And it doesn't have to be that you would be terrified of death if you would come back to Christ, if you would make Christ the center of your life again. That's how we can come to see death as gain, by living for Him while we're on this earth. Look again with me at verse 23. We can come to see death as gain by shifting our desires. Look what Paul says again in 23. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and to be with Christ. Paul had the desire to be with Christ. What is your desire where is your heart set in life? What do you treasure in your life and in your heart? You know, Jesus said, wherever a man's heart, uh, treasure is, there his heart will be also. What do you treasure in life? Do you think about heaven very often? 
Do you think about being with Christ very often? Do you think about seeing his face? Or is our mind on the world? Whether the sinful things of this world or just the normal things of this world, the everyday busyness and the daily things of life. And I, I rarely think about heaven. I rarely think about death. I rarely think about how it would be gained to me. Where is your hope in life? Peter says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 13, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All of our hope should be on that Jesus is going to return. I'm going to be with Jesus. I have a home in heaven. Peter said earlier in, in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we have an inheritance which is imperishable, and undefiled and will not fade away and it's reserved in heaven for you. Do you think about such truths and realities? I know it's hard because we get busy in life. We have things going on in life and we rarely stop to think, I am going to die one day. And we rarely stop to think, I'm going to be with Christ. We don't have that desire like we should. We need to shift our desires. We need to dwell on these things. We need to meditate on these things. Read about these things. Set your mind on these realities about heaven. We need to sing about these things. I think I was thinking as I was preparing the sermon, one of my goals, kind of not, not too seriously, but, but kind of is serious. I want you all to sing. Not, not just here at church, but in your life, in your car, in the shower. I want you to sing about Christ. I want you to sing about heaven. There's a power in that. It reminds us of these things. We have such great songs about heaven. How, how beautiful heaven must be. You know, dwell on that. Sing about that. One of my favorites is uh, heaven holds all to me. You know that one? Sing it nice and slow. Heaven holds all to me. Brighter its glory will be. Joy without measure will be my treasure. Heaven holds all to me. As we sang this morning, to Canaan's land, I'm on my way. You know, dwell on these things. And I think that as we do, our desire to be with Christ will grow and will grow. Our desire and our ability to say, Yes, to die is gain. We'll be able to say that in our hearts. Third, how can we come to see death as gain? We need to strengthen our relationship with Christ. Look again at verse 23 with me. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. You notice Paul doesn't just say, I have the desire to depart. I have the desire to be in this place of bliss. Why was it that Paul had the desire to depart? It was because he longed for Christ. He, he had a desire to be with Christ. And uh, I would think Paul would say that if Christ is not there, then I don't want to be there. I want to be with Christ. And what if we, in our lives, what if we don't really have a relationship with Christ? What will that do to our longing and desire to be in heaven? Well, I don't really know Christ. I, I don't really spend time with Jesus. I'm not really walking with Jesus. I don't really think about Jesus on a daily basis. And so if that's the truth, then why would we say, I have this desire to go and be with Jesus if we don't know Jesus? We need to be working on our relationship with Him. We need to be strengthening that relationship, walking with Him. Our relationship with Jesus is not just some sort of cold legal arrangement. There's supposed to be heart in it. There's supposed to be love in it. There's supposed to be a, a delight in Him and an adoration of Him. And that I'm growing in my knowledge of Him and my relationship with Him. And that means everything to me. And so, yes, I can say... It's very much better to go and be with Christ. Do you have that kind of thought in your heart? Let's spend more time with Christ and our desire to depart and to be with Him will grow 
ever greater. Next, I think we need to realize that departing is very much better. Paul says at the end of verse 23, I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Not just a little bit better. Not just, well, it's kind of even. I have a great life here and going to heaven to be with Christ, it would be, it would be okay too. No, he says it's very much better to go and to be with Christ. And I do think that we struggle with this because most of us here probably could say we have a good life, we have a comfortable life, we have, we have an, a nice life, but we need to realize that departing is very much better. What keeps us from realizing this? I think part of it is that we, we do sometimes feel that we still have work to do and work to accomplish in this life. Even so, I think we should still be able to say, I would love to accomplish these things, but still, to be with Christ is very much better. I think sometimes we, we don't have this realization that it's very much better because we have a, um, not, a, not a correct view of what heaven is. What do most people think about when they think about heaven, you know, in the world? And maybe, maybe some of us, you think about on the cloud, right, playing the harp. And I think people look at that and they think, that doesn't really appeal to me. Um, that's not what heaven is going to be like. Uh, I hope you had a chance to read the article that Russ has in the bulletin. I decided to run that article because it fits so well with the sermon. And he says there, and I think it's right, paradise lost in the garden. Paradise lost will be paradise regained in heaven. I think heaven is going to be a lot like the Garden of Eden. Walking with God. Walking with Jesus. I think it's going to be a lot like things that we recognize and know and love in this life. You know, you look in the Bible, the descriptions of heaven. There's a river of life. There's a tree of life. These are things we can relate to. These are things that were in the garden, like the tree of life, that we think are beautiful, that God made, made the garden that way because He said it was good and He knew it would be beautiful and that we would love it. I think that's how heaven is going to be. There's the mountain of God. There's the city of God. There's the sea of crystal. And I don't think it'll be like, just like this earth. It'll be much more wonderful and things I'm sure that we can't comprehend that we will see and experience in heaven. But we'll be walking with Jesus. Just like in the garden. We're going to see Him face to face. We're going to be like Him. We're going to have a new body that will not wear out and will not get sick and will not decay. No pain, no ailments, no growing old, no sickness, no death. That's what we have to look forward to. Are you looking forward to that? How beautiful heaven must be. And if we understood what awaited us, if we understood what heaven really was, I think we would say with Paul, I love my life here. I have things I want to do here. But to go and to be with Christ is very much better. Let's try to get there in our hearts and in our minds. I want to read to you from Revelation chapter 7, which was also in the bulletin article this week. And it's a, a glimpse. It's a glimpse of heaven. I just want you to listen to it and take it in. It's Revelation chapter 7. Let's begin in verse 11. Revelation 7, 11. Listen to these words. Do you want to be here? Is this your desire? Is this your goal in life? Revelation 7, 11. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. 
Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who were clothed in white robes, who are they? And where have they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down upon them, nor any heat, for the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of water, of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Do you long for that? Do you long to be with the Lamb, Jesus Christ? Can you say, or will we try to grow in this thought, that to die is gain? That to die, you know, I, I think we fear, I think all of us have this fear of, of going to the doctor and they tell you the, the bad news. Some of you have experienced that. But what if we could get to the point where we say, yes, that's going to rattle my world. That's going to shake me to my core. But once I can process that, I can begin to say, I'm seeing the path opening before me that will lead to the best day of my life. That I go home to be with the Lord forever. And I, I'm, yes, a little nervous. I'm a little unsure about how it will all be and how it will feel. But I know that to go home to be with the Lord is very much better. And I want you to know this morning that this confidence that we can have, this surety, it only comes from being united to Jesus Christ. It only comes for those who are in Christ. And so I ask you this morning, are you in Christ? Have you been immersed into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? And are you walking faithfully with Jesus? Is he your life? If there's anyone here this morning that would like prayers, if there's anyone here that needs to respond to the invitation of Christ, because he's inviting you, come to me. Put me on in baptism, and I'll wipe away every sin and every stain, and you can have the hope, the expectation, the confidence that you will be with me forever. If you have any need at all, would you come while we stand and sing?